All right, good evening, everyone. It's 7 p.m. Time for another Practical Farmers of Iowa Farminar. Welcome. Tonight, uh, we're going to be hearing about extending the corn and soybean rotation to include small grains. We've got two really great speakers tonight. Uh, we have Dick Sloan, who farms up in Buchanan County near the town of Rowley. And we also have agronomist Dr. Matt Liebman uh, from Iowa State University here. Let's take a look at um, the fall farm in our calendar. Uh, as you can see, we've already had a couple uh, in this series, and we have a number coming up going into December. So mark those down on your calendar to tune in for those as well. Just a little background about uh, Practical Farmers of Iowa. We were founded back in the mid 1980s. We are farmer led and member driven, and we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, here's a little bit about uh, our mission, uh, just furthering the point that we are farmer-led and uh, member-driven. Um, we do a lot of farmer investigation and information sharing. Uh, that is pretty much the basis of what we do and why we do what we do here at Practical Farmers of Iowa. Um, these are some of the values that our membership have identified uh, over the years that you can read here. And we do offer events like these farminars in our field days for free, but we are a member organization and do encourage people to join at uh, one of these levels. Uh, with membership, you get our newsletter, quarterly newsletter mailed directly to you. Uh, you can participate in a number of online uh, email discussion groups, and you can get discounted rates um, to our um, annual conference coming up. We also keep a calendar on our website of all the events that we do. Uh, I think we hold around 90 events every year, either online, meetings, field days, uh, you name it. Um, so take a look at the calendar for all the events that we host. Uh, I mentioned our annual conference that is coming up um, at the end of January. Um, so please, um, you know, if you're interested, take a look at that link provided at the bottom. It's also linked on our website. See uh, the full slate of presenters that we have coming to Ames this year. Okay, before we get going and I turn it over to uh, Dick Sloan, just a few uh, ground rules. Um, we've reserved the final 30 minutes for the question and answer session, but as questions come to you, use that chat box in the lower left. Some of you have signed in with your name, location, and email address. If something um, you're curious about or concerned about uh, during one of the presentations, type in a question there and we will try to address it um, at the end of both presentations. So that's uh, what I have as far as an introduction. We're gonna hand it over to farmer Dick Sloan right now and um, enjoy the farm in our. Dick, it's all you. Thank you, Stefan. I hope you can hear me all right. Is it coming through good? We uh, had this program set up and I thought, well, what are all the good reasons that you might want to extend your rotation beyond corn and beans? And so I started to list in uh, soil health, the water quality, resilience, which is more of a, a capacity for our crops to remain productive in adverse weather situations, be they wet or dry. And sustainability would be uh, keeping ourselves from um, depleting our natural resources in the, in the process. And even landscape hydrology is something we can move forward. To explain where I am in Iowa, I pulled up this map from the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. Uh, it's the Outstanding Iowa Waters program that they have. And I actually farm right in the southwest corner of Buchanan County where you see Lime Creek and Bear Creek. Well, I farm kind of right in between the two of them in the watershed of the Middle Cedar River Basin. And that's all right. Um, so these are uh, waters and streams which have high quality and provide uh, natural habitat for um, which which is becoming rarer and rarer in Iowa. We have uh, at least six species of mussels that 
or uh, living in Lime Creek, um, all the sorts of things that we, the interaction with the fish species that are there and, and are the things that we need to protect in the environment. Um, this next set of slides I had gotten from my partnership with the Iowa Learning Farms, and they're an attempt by Dr. Matt Helmers at Iowa State University to use some modern modeling techniques to hindcast erosion and water flow of the past, and then assess the present and model a potential future scenario at the Helmers family farm. By interviewing his father and grandfather, he is able to discern some of the impacts that our changing farming systems have had over the last century. Located in northwest Iowa, the Helmers family farm is representative of the sort of changes that are common to most Iowa farms. Let me get my arrow here going. I can point out a couple things. The, uh, if you look here at the row crop usage from the 30s through the 50s, you can see that it had a big jump once we started using chemical fertilizers to replace uh, small grains and pastures and hay ground and increase the amount of row crop using. Um, the impact of this um, you can see how in the 50s and, and 70s, we had quite a bit of sediment delivery to the watershed outlets. And while we've made a lot of changes now, we still um, haven't made much progress on the water um, delivery to the, to the sites. So the loss of small grains and perennials in Iowa has had an impact on our landscape, increasing the likelihood of flooding from extreme rainfall events. I started uh, growing cover crops, uh, rye cover crop, in 2011 by aerial seeding 125 acres of cereal rye into standing soybeans and corn. I was encouraged by the results that year. It was a rather mild year, and a lot of times in February, you could go up on the silo and take pictures around um, and see how many green fields there were. I just was impressed with the fact that we could be catching sunlight and using it for something during that off season. Um, encouraged by the results that first year and by the growing evidence of the need for cover crops to improve soil health, I purchased a 15-foot drill in 2012 and doubled my rye plantings. By 2013, I was ready to commit to the practices you see here in my CSP contract. NRCS payments from this set of practices nearly covers the cost of my cover crop seeds and aerial application into mid and late season corn. I drill cover crop mixes immediately after harvesting my group two soybeans and early season corn. A valuable part of my contract was the decision to grow 20 acres of cereal rye for grain to use as cover crop seed. It's a resource conserving crop rotation when the straw is not removed from the field and when it is grown in combination with a green manure crop, whether interseeded or planted after small grain harvest. This is uh, some pictures of my fields this spring after planting, but before I burned down the herbicide, um, I planted both soybeans and corn into green cover this year. It had been a hard year. Uh, the field on the right is a corn field. The field on the left is a soybean field. The soybean field had been drilled at an angle. You can kind of see the rows heading off across the old corn rows. And that was seeded to rye, oats, and rapeseed uh, on September 3rd of 1913, or 2013. And then the field on the right is a 40-30 blend of wheat and rye. And that was drilled following soybean harvest October 14th of 13. These photos were taken May 14th. So this is an aerial view of the first field that 
I decided to ex have some experience with on, on planting um, cereal rye for grain harvest. I get my pointer working here. You can see the part of the field here that runs along and then angles up is a hilltop area to the upper part. This up here had been a, a, where a barn site had been across from the road from uh, an old building site. And so there's a clay, buried buildings. There's quite a bit of slope down this direction of the field. There's grass headlands on the ends, a contour grass strip through over here and another grass headland along this road. You can also see a waterway down through this field. The problem that I had in this field was that when I laid it out, I was too aggressive in my curves. And so I ended up um, capturing water at about this point in the field where it would run down across the field instead of reaching the end of the, of the field. So I wanted to soften these curves, change the way that my field was contoured, and build some berms that I'll show you later. So anyway, I planted this 13 acres in, um, let's see, I drilled 60 pounds of rye into this field after soybean harvest in 2012. Um, I also decided that uh, since I'd learned so much about growing cover crops from my friends at Practical Farmers, that I would participate in a project that would compare spring seeded medium red clover with a summer seeded diverse mix of cowpeas, sun hemp, oats, radish, bursim, and crimson clover. So if you look closely, you can kind of see there's some strips that show in here. And these strips are uh, 30 foot wide, just as this grass strip is up here. Get that out. So this is in the spring. Um, I did not have a method to frost seed um, with my new drill. I didn't know how to do that yet. And wanting to get it seeded in, I basically, in late April, just went in as gently and shallowly as I could into my growing rye crop and sort of followed the pattern of my fall seeded rye and drilled in 30-foot strips of clover and then left 30 foot strips and then this actually worked pretty well you can see the clover coming up in between the rye in the photo on the left and then in the photo on the right I have a pretty good stand of clover growing in the rye where on the left side of the field the picture on the right uh, you can see that the weeds are starting to come up through some of the rye So in July, when it was time to harvest, uh, I wanted to measure the straw yield as well as the grain yield from my rye. And I had a friend with a smaller combine and more experience harvesting small grains and hired him to, use to, to harvest the field for me. And then I had another friend that came in and baled the straw to use as cattle feed. This is the berm on the north end of the field that um, get my pointer working here. You can see how uh, we picked up the and and softened the curve and brought the water up, and then this created a farmable berm. So about the the right hand side of this is seeded to grasses and is part of my contour hay strip, and then the lower part is part of the field which would be rotated from corn to soybeans and whatever rotation I choose to use. I did a similar project on the other end of the field. Um, the grass, um, it's, it's easier to get a, uh, a land improvement contractor to come in and do some of the fiddling with these kind of small projects in the summertime and so it was a good opportunity to, to make uh, good use of that summer season. <laughs> uh, 
so it was a very dry summer uh, the way it turned out at the end of 2013. Um, we didn't have a very good establishment of the diverse legume mix. Um, the medium red clover had been well established and you can see by October in the right hand photo that um, the weed control was much better where I used the medium red clover in the strips than it was over uh, in the diverse seeding mix. The strips were measured. I did go out and do biomass samples out in these strips. Uh, the summer mix yielded 2,770 pounds per acre of biomass, uh, 1,166 pounds of, of carbon per acre, and 44 pounds of nitrogen per acre. The red clover side yielded 5,614 pounds per acre. It produced 2,469 pounds of carbon and 128 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So it looked like we had a, a quite pretty good shot of nitrogen to start off the next year with. Now this is, this is an overhead view of the farm where I grew up near Interstate 380. If I can get my, I'm not getting my pointer to work. Oh, shoot. There it comes. Now I got it. So the two fields that I next decided to um, put to rye were these, this field on the east side of Interstate 380 and another field that was on the west side of Interstate 380. And together they are about 20 acres, a little, or the, little more than that. Um, it was in, let's see, so it was, lose track of my years here, 2013 we had soybeans here and then drilled that in the fall to 112 pounds of rye per acre. And then uh, I learned that my seeding rate was probably too low. I needed more like a two bushel rate for my seeding rye for cereal grain instead of the slightly more than one bushel that I'd put on back in the previous year, in my beginning year. And um, while I'm on this photo, I want to also point out um, this fall in 2014, I decided to additionally grow 10 acres of wheat. And I put that back here in this part of the field of this North 80. So I have 10 acres of wheat planted this fall in this field, which was soybeans in 2014. And then over in this field, which was soybeans in 2014, I had a 75 foot strip from the driveway that comes along and goes along some of these grass contours and then goes back up here next to some CRP strips and fills in around uh, an old uh, quarry area right here and along hilltop and another CRP strip on this side and all together this 20 acres will make it a lot easier to plant in the spring. I'll plant my corn on that part of the field, the upper part of the field, the field parts that are more open and more productive. I'm going to keep in corn following soybeans and try and use some of the difficult areas to increase my efficiency next spring. Next year, I'm going to plant soybeans in this field. Now, this field had been used as a borrow to build the interstate to take subsoil from this part of the field and move up here to build the bridge access for Interstate 380. So this isn't the best soil down here either. It tends to be wet at times and then it also has sandy soils that dry out later in the year. So hopefully by having a crop that matures in July, I'll be able to um, withstand the, the wet period, but not have it dry out. And uh, this tends to be not very productive corn ground. Being sandy, it'll dry out and, and not produce as much yield as I would like to have. So those are some of my ideas about where I'm putting different kinds of 
some mixes and stuff. And get this out of there. Now this is a, a picture of the uh, east side of Interstate 380 in November 2013. You can see that 112 pounds per acre of rye drilled in October can produce a notably greener field in the fall than fields where I've drilled 60 to 70 pounds of winter grain mixes. One potential problem that I realized um, with winter grains is that I have an area of the field where you can see that water stands and ice can form over the winter as the snow is melting and draining off across the field. Uh, this ice could rob the rye from light and nutrition and end up with some bare patches in the field. If it had gotten worse, I probably would have had to go in here and either um, sprayed it and then, and then drilled in some oats, something different to come in here. I can't do any tillage because of my no-till practices but I decided that it was good enough stand that it, it could uh, just, I could live with it this year. So um, it might impact other farmers' choices of which fields they might choose to use though. Now one of the upshots of going to the cooperators conference last year was that I got some good tips on how to frost seed and how to lay out my strips better. Um, Bob Lynch said, gee, his drill, all he did is uh, hook some hoses on instead of the drops that go down to the planting units. And then you can see what I did. I just uh, used plastic straps and tied heavy duty plastic straps. I drilled a hole through a two by four every seven and a half inches. I used regular garden hose to come up here and then I just tied off the other hoses uh, to the garden hose so that it would keep them up out of the way. Um, I want to add a cylinder over here so that I can turn off and on the grass seed box. So I wasn't putting anything out of my main box. I had my grass seed box set up for 15 pounds per acre of um, medium red clover and I also invested in an auto steer system this year so that I could um, drill 60 feet and then jump over 60 feet and come back and, and keep everything parallel. Um, the auto steer system made, made things a lot easier for me to try and figure out where I was supposed to be in the field. The other thing that I did is to fertilize my rye this year and I used a 55-52-120 fertilizer mix, dry fertilizer mix, uh, April 18th of 14. It produced a good crop of rye and my shoulder high rye decided that with all the extra rain that we had this year during April, May, and June that it got really tall and thick and then it blew down. Uh, I still was able to get it harvested with my 9570 John Deere combine and a 25 foot grain head. I had to run the grain head right down tight to the ground, just like I was harvesting soybeans and drive along at less than two mile an hour, but I was able to pull in most of the rye. Uh, didn't even have to go one way and, and stuff. The field on the east ended up producing about 38 bushel an acre. The little field on the west did about 44 bushel an acre. Uh, that was the quantities that I was able to deliver to my local seed cleaning business. So with what I needed for my own use this year in cover crops, I was also able to sell 464 bushels of cleaned and bagged rye for a price of about $11 a bushel. That was the wholesale price my local seed dealer was able to buy it for, and so it sounded fair to me. And that's what I, the cost of cleaning at a local seed business was $1.75 a bushel and bagging is another 80 cents a bushel. So,
this is the the uh, summer the strips that I established on the west side of the field. Um, quite a bit better. Quite a, quite a bit better looking uh, field and, and strips than what I was able to produce the first year. I uh, did have quite a bit of rye that went out the back of the combine or didn't make it in the head. I can't say for sure which. Uh, and so I'm still learning to um, get some of that. But it wasn't, uh, the, the straw was pretty heavy and I was a little concerned when that clover was really small that I was going to not be uh, uniform enough in my um, distribution out the back of the combine and uh, out of the choppers and um, I did even on the one field go out and try to scatter it with a first harrow uh, one of those chain type drag harrows that farmers sometimes have um, but I can't say that it was any better where I harrowed it or where I just let it come up naturally. So uh, all in all, I think I was pretty pleased with uh, how things went. So, um, so the next step after you've learned to grow rye is uh, what to do to good, do a good job growing corn after the rye. Uh, this is a picture from May 3rd or so and the clover's already getting to be six inches tall. It's really thick. This is time to kill it. Um, I did not go ahead and kill it at this time. I ended up thinking that well I'll let it grow because I want to produce more nitrogen and, and it was tempting and I let myself do that but um, the trouble with that is you get it too much uh, growth and then it's hard to get your seed established um, for closing the seed slots on the planter and and everything else uh, just seems like uh, one of those things that I'm I'm still learning um, so I was able to get a fairly good stand established um, even though it was a little bit more stunted where I had the heavy growth of clover um, I, when I plant my corn no-till, I do put on a 27-21-6 fertilizer package at planting. And then in early June of 2014, I, um, I put on um, 80 pounds of nitrogen in the strips where I didn't have the clover. There was about that much difference in, in the nitrogen, the, the fall uh, measurements compared to uh, where the clover had been and um, so I thought that would might help equalize the uh, the package um, but my late spring nitrate tests didn't come back from the lab until July somehow I think they got lost in the mail or something uh, and they were both quite low they were at 7.01 and 8.24 parts per million and um, by mid-July, the corn's tasseled. It's getting too late to try to side dress any nitrogen, even with a high boy. And so I wasn't able to get any more nitrogen put on the field. And then in the fall, my yields were low, and my corn stalk nitrate tests came back at less than 20 parts per million of nitrate nitrogen. So that's extremely low and something that I'm learning to do better about. So. I'm very interested to uh, hear from Dr. Liebman and find out uh, what his advice he might have for me as well as the rest of the farmers here at Practical Farmers. So uh, if Matt's ready, why I'm ready to turn it over and, and see what he can teach us. Hey there. Drake's bringing up the slides. Thank you, Dick, for sharing all that good information. Um, I'll talk a little bit tonight about what I've been doing for the last 12 years on a uh, experiment in Boone County 
at Iowa State University's Marson Farm. Um, some of the issues I'll touch on tonight relate to uh, things we hear a lot about in the farm community. More and more uh, discussion of herbicide resistant weeds. Um, new crop diseases like sudden death syndrome and soybean. And I'll talk about how extending the corn soybean rotation with small grains and uh, forage legumes like clover and alfalfa seem to have a big impact on that. I'll talk about soil erosion, water quality effects on nutrient emissions, and um, volatility in crop production costs and crop prices and what the implications are for uh, farm economics when you diversify. So um, bear with me and uh, I look forward to your questions and I um, very much appreciate uh, Dick's insights. So I hope you get some feedback from him as well. The uh, question that we set out to answer back in uh, starting in 2001 and 2002, and we really kicked into gear in 2003, was whether diversifying corn and soybean systems with small grains and forages could uh, reduce requirements for purchased inputs, maintain or improve profitability and productivity, suppress weeds, reduce susceptibility to certain diseases, and improve our environmental performance characteristics. So I've been working with a uh, pretty large and diverse group of people, some students, people at the uh, USDA lab in Ames, and uh, other faculty here at Iowa State University, but also at places in uh, the Midwest, like the University of Minnesota and University of Illinois. So our, uh, our setup is uh, at the ISU Marsden Farm in Boone County, and uh, we're on about 22 acres of land broken up into plots that are uh, distributed in these three rotation systems. We have a cash grain corn and soybean system, a three year rotation that extends corn and soybean with oats underseeded with red clover, and that red clover is used as a green manure. We don't harvest it, although we do harvest the oat crop for both grain and straw. And we have a four year rotation that we have oats underseeded with alfalfa, and we harvest typically one cut in the seeding year with oats, and then uh, three to five cuts in the subsequent year of the alfalfa. I don't know how to, how do I go forward here? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I mentioned these plots are uh, 60 by 275 feet. There are 36 of them. And uh, we have every entry point, each phase of each rotation present every year. We started in 2001 by seeding the whole area to oats. We ran a uh, combine with a yield monitor over it. We laid out the plots based on the heterogeneity in the field, soil fertility, weeds, all these things entered into uh, how we laid out the experiment. Uh, we considered the 2003 through 2005 years kind of the, the baseline uh, startup period. And then from 2006, we sort of considered that's the mature period where we've gone through the rotations at least once. And the data are more representative of what would be going on if you had the rotations in place. All right. So one thing to know about this kind of setup is that what's on a given plot in any one year changes to the next crop in the rotation in the following year. So corn in yellow turns into soybean in green and soybean in green in the three-year rotation and the four-year rotation turns into uh, small grains with either red clover or oats or alfalfa and oats. And then you've got the um, hay crop in the four-year rotation. So by having every phase in these rotations present every year, we know what's going on with all the crops, regardless of what the weather throws at us. 
I should mention that in these three and the four year rotations, where we've got uh, red clover and alfalfa, we also apply some manure. We apply seven tons on a fresh weight basis in the fall. And then uh, come November, we plow and that ground will be planted to corn in the following year. The amount of manure we're applying, we figure is actually a bit less than the amount of manure that would be supported by the number of cattle we could support with the concentrate feeds and forages grown in each rotation. So we're not subsidizing these systems with manure. We're redistributing it as if we were in a integrated crop livestock system. All right, so you can see here our uh, contrasting nitrogen fertility management systems. In the two-year system, we put 100 pounds end down per acre at planting, and we then side dress according to uh, the results we get from a late spring nitrate test. And some years we put on nothing, and some years we put on a lot. In the three and the four year systems, we don't put any mineral fertilizer down at planting, but we do do a late spring nitrate test in those plots and we'll side dress again according to uh, the test results. So we're relying much more heavily on nitrogen derived from the residues of the alfalfa and the red clover and nitrogen that's coming out of the manure. But as it turns out, the amount of manure we're applying it's not a big source of N, it's an important source of phosphorus and potash, but uh, the amount we're applying is not a huge amount of nitrogen. All right, in the uh, extended rotations, we use less herbicide. And uh, in the base set of treatments, we've been using non-transgenic corn and non-transgenic soy. We banned herbicides in the three and the four year rotation. We use post-emergence materials like uh, Callisto and Steadfast or Lotus and corn. And in soybean, we've been using a mixture of Select, Phoenix and Resource, or Select and Cadet, or Phoenix and Raptor. The particular herbicides we use depend on the uh, time of application, the species identities of the weeds, and uh, their densities. In the two-year corn, we go with a very standard package we've been using transgenic corn with uh, resistance to insects and transgenic soybean with uh, tolerance of glyphosate. And we've been broadcasting herbicides. We use uh, pre-emergence materials in the corn, typically uh, dual to magnum and balance pro or Zidua and balance pro or uh, Corvus. In the two-year soybean, we've been using a Roundup based system or equivalents of Roundup. And now we're starting to see some challenges from what look like resistant weeds, and we're adding to the Roundup Ultra Blazer. In the uh, three and the four year rotations, as I mentioned, we use band applications of herbicides. We cultivate between the rows of both corn and soy, but we also gain weed control in the three and the four year rotations by having the small grains in the system, and they uh, break up the life cycle of weeds that are well adapted to corn and soy. By harvesting the small grains in the middle of the summer, we cut them off. And then um, I like to clip the stubble of the small grains about five or six weeks after planting to keep any weeds that would uh, contribute seed down to a very small size. All right, so what are the effects of uh, extending the rotation and um, gaining the benefits of nitrogen fixation by red clover and alfalfa, adding some manure, and banding herbicides and cultivating? In the case of herbicides, we've reduced our herbicide use 96 to 97% in the three and four year rotations relative to the two year rotation. And in the case of mineral and fertilizer, we've uh, dropped our N applications about 90%. It varies from year to year, but you can see the averages there drop in corn from 147 pounds N per acre down to 23 and 20 in the three and the four year rotations. The small values you see in the other crops represent the nitrogen applied in um, 
monoammonium or diammonium phosphate that we apply to uh, maintain P and K levels in uh, all the rotations. All right, so let's look at um, what the impacts of these systems are on soil. So there's uh, about 22 acres here involved in this rotation experiment with a uh, height differential of um, about, uh, where's my arrow? So, yeah, okay, so up in this northwest corner, <clears throat> it's about 12 feet higher than down in this southeast corner. And uh, I've worked with the scientists at the National Lab for Ag and Environment that USDA runs, and we've actually mapped out the flow paths based on the elevation differences. And you can see that the water gathers and then runs down to the southeast corner. We've also mapped the soil types. With knowledge of what the topography and the soil types are, we can generate a uh, estimate of soil erosion as if the whole area we're in the two-year or the three-year or the four-year rotation. And this is based on the revised universal soil loss equation, which takes into account um, sheet and rail erosion. It does not take into account ephemeral gully erosion, which can be equal to the uh, sheet and rail erosion. But just to give you an idea, we get about a 25% reduction in the erosion rate going to the three-year rotation and a four-year rotation drops it to about 31% below the two-year rate. These rates in the two-year are low because we have a relatively flat site, but uh, they do show you that even when we plow red clover in the three-year system and alfalfa in the four-year system, um, we're not generating a lot of erosion potential. What about soil physical properties? So this is the two-year rotation up here. In the corner here, up on the left, you can see big blocks of soil. And this is the three-year system and the four-year system. The soil is much more granulated, much more friable, much softer. And when we measure soil bulk density, which is a indicator of the amount of weight per unit of volume with low values, indicating more air. You can see in the top six inches, our three and four year rotations are much better aerated. That translates down into the six to 12 inch depth. That actually, that trend is visible all the way down to 24 inches. And the average is uh, statistically significant. We have more air, less compaction in the longer rotations where we have the legume roots and the additional crop residues and some manure being worked into the ground. Some other soil quality indicators have been evaluated by uh, Michelle Wander's group at the University of Illinois and uh, a student of uh, one of my colleagues here at Iowa State. So particulate organic matter, carbon, is that fraction of the organic matter that is most responsive to changes in tillage, most responsive to additions of organic matter in the form of crop residues and manure. And you can see that we have more particulate organic matter carbon in the three and the four year rotations than in the two year rotation. We have more microbial biomass. So this is the microbes that are working to digest the organic matter that are important for disease suppression and other biological functions. And we have statistically more in the three and the four year rotation than in the two year rotation. Finally, potentially mineralizable nitrogen is an indicator of the release of nitrogen from organic matter in the soil when microbes can digest it for a period of time. So you take the soil into the lab, you add some moisture and you effectively incubate it and look at the addition of mineral nitrogen, plant available nitrogen that accrues from the decomposing organic matter. And again, the three and the four year rota rotations have more potentially mineralizable nitrogen than the two year rotation. And this is an effect that you see in the field when late in the season, your corn crop is remaining green. It's being spoon fed nitrogen 
from that slow release organic matter source that the two-year corn that's mostly feeding on mineral fertilizer that's being dissipated as the season goes on is running out of. All right, what about weeds? We backed off 96, 97% in terms of the herbicide use. But what you see here is that the amount of weed material in the corn crop in the two-year system was statistically lower than in the three and the four-year system, but it's biologically trivial. And by that, I mean two pounds of weed dry matter versus seven pounds um, would be very difficult to detect with your eye. We can detect it by clipping large amounts of the plot area, but it, it would have nothing to do with the crop yields and it would have very little to do with long-term weed dynamics. Similarly, um, we had more weed dry matter in the soybean in the three-year system than in the two-year and four-year system, but these numbers are extremely small. Where we are getting some weed growth is in the stubble of the oats. You can see it here, 65 pounds in the three-year rotation, 33 pounds in the four-year rotation. And uh, we're picking up some weed dry matter in the alfalfa in those years when we're getting some winter kill. Okay, I mentioned that uh, rotations can influence diseases like sudden death syndrome. Sudden death is caused by a soil-borne fungus, um, Fusarium virgiliforme. It infects the roots causes some root rot and poor root vigor, but it also injects a toxin that can move from the roots to the leaves. And uh, under cool, wet conditions, you can see fairly serious yield losses. So in the foreground, you can see plants actually in the two-year rotation that have lost most of their leaves due to sudden death. And in the um, area back here, these bright green plants are actually in the three-year rotation right next door. And those plants are holding onto their leaves and we'll see yield effects in a minute. So incidence is the number of plants that are affected by the disease. Severity is of the plants that are affected, how bad is it? And my colleague, Leonor Leandro has rated this over the past uh, four or five years. We grew two different cultivars of soybean, a Roundup Ready one and a uh, non-transgenic one in all of the plots during these years. And for both cultivars, we saw a reduction in both the incidence and the severity of the disease as we went from the two-year rotation to the three and the four-year rotation. So side by side, row to row, we could see these reductions in disease problems in the longer rotations relative to the two-year rotation for two different cultivars. All right, what about our yields? So for both corn and soybean, we see statistically significant increases in yield between the two-year system and the uh, three and the four-year systems. For soybean, that effect is really quite strong. We go from an average of 47 bushels an acre over the last uh, period of years from 2006, 2006 to 2014. We go from 47 bushels up to 55 bushels on average. This includes its drought years, the year where we had severe hail. So uh, some years we've done better than that. For corn, our two-year average is running at 188, but our four-year average is up to 197. We actually see a statistically significant increase in oat yields from 93 bushels an acre in the three-year rotation with red clover as the companion crop up to 97 bushels an acre where alfalfa is the companion crop. Our alfalfa years, yields have been running right about the state average, a little over four tons an acre. All right, we looked at fossil energy use and economics on a land area basis. And by a land area basis, I mean if you've got corn and soybean, 
uh, we look at the average over both of those crops. If you have corn, soybean, and oats with red clover, we look at the averages over all those crops. And with the four-year rotation, we look at all four phases of the rotation. So uh, we'll look at energy use first. Um, I've expressed it both on a barrels of oil equivalent per acre and a gallons of diesel fuel equivalent per acre. And we're getting uh, more than a 50% reduction in the amount of fossil energy we're consuming between the two-year system and the uh, more energy thrifty three and four-year systems. The major categories of fossil energy use are nitrogen fertilizer, which takes a lot of natural gas to produce. Gas for drying corn when we harvest it in a wet year and we need to dry it down, and then tractor fuel. So one of the effects of diversity is we're lowering our fossil energy inputs. What about uh, costs and prices for our economic calculations? We took the input costs from ISU Extension's annual report, costs of crop production in Iowa and from local businesses. We took the uh, machinery operation costs and labor based on our field notes and ISU's extension bulletin called Estimating Field Capacity of Farm Machines. Hay and grain prices were taken, taken from the marketing year averages released by USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service. We didn't include any subsidy payments. Important here is that we assume that the manure was generated on farm or by nearby livestock, and that we didn't have a cost for the material. We did charge ourselves for the labor and machinery costs associated with spreading it. All right, here you see the uh, range of prices that we use for our crops in our analyses between 2008 and 2013. There's uh, a big range here from about 359 up to 692 for corn, 952 to 1440 for soybean, almost double in price from $2 up to 415 for oats. Big variation in alfalfa, hay prices based on uh, droughts out west. And um, we took each of these yearly variations into account when we did the economics. So here are some of the results for labor and economics. Uh, labor inputs are higher for the four-year rotation and the three-year rotation compared to the two-year rotation. And this reflects more labor for um, making hay, more labor for harvesting the small grains and the straw in the middle of the summer, and more labor for spreading some manure and cultivating between the corn and the soybean rows. The gross returns were higher for the two-year rotation than for the three and the four year rotation. But the cost of production were also higher for the two year rotation relative to the three and the four year rotation. And when we looked at the net returns to land and management for all three of the systems, statistically there was no difference, although the three and the four year systems were a little higher numerically. So what we can conclude is that diversity increased our labor requirements, but it lowered our uh, input costs and ultimately resulted in similar profits relative to the two-year system. If we looked at where our costs were in the different systems, in the um, two-year system where we were using transgenic crops and quite a lot more fertilizer, that resulted in higher input costs relative to the three and the four year systems where we didn't use transgenic cultivars and uh, we use much less fertilizer. So there are some other differences, but those are the big ones. All right, when we look at net returns by crop, you can get a better idea of what's going on during the rotation. So net returns in our three and our four year corn were actually quite a bit higher than in the two-year corn. Similarly, with our higher soybean yields and our lower input costs, our three and our four-year soybeans, we're netting more per acre than the two-year. The oats 
and the alfalfa netted less than corn, but they're part of the rotation system. You can't get rid of them. They're the nurse crop for the red clover and the alfalfa that supply our nitrogen. Moreover, they supply, through cultural practices, quite a bit of weed control. So I look at it as a system, but it's interesting to see here that our corn is uh, doing well. It's yielding a bit more using many fewer inputs, and our soybean is yielding higher and it's using fewer inputs. So in conclusion, uh, increasing cropping system diversity with small grains like oats and forage legumes like red clover and alfalfa can be a viable strategy for reducing reliance on purchased inputs, achieving decent weed control, and maintaining yields and profits. And if you want to read about this, you can uh, read about it from this article. It's free online, or you can look at uh, web materials that I'd be happy to send you. So with that, I'll uh, finish and uh, open it up to any questions you might have. And Dick, I'm uh, interested in your responses in particular. I congratulate you, Matt, on what you're accomplishing. Uh, I think that you've uh, proven yourself to be a good farmer along with uh, a good researcher here. So, um, Thank you. Um, yeah. On my farm, I've tried to do uh, corn, corn, and then soybean rotation. And um, that corn on corn no-till year can be quite uh, challenging on particular soils. Um, on well-drained soils, uh, lighter textured soils, I have a pretty good uh, response. But um, I really think that if I could use uh, soybean, rye, or wheat, followed by legume, and then corn, that it would be a very good alternative on particularly difficult fields um, to make that corn on corn year work. So, um, Yeah, the, the challenge on um, corn on corn and poorly drained ground is often cold, wet soils in the spring. Um, it's hard to warm them up with all that residue. So I know some farmers are working with strip till, trying to uh, get sun onto um, bare ground right in the seeding row to warm it up and get more um, uh, warming to get the, the corn up quicker and um, help it drain a little bit. I, I think that would be a good option for me. I have a neighbor that's, uh, I think, starting to do some strip till. I saw some pretty good equipment moving across his field, and I may be tempted to uh, hire them to to uh, do that on a few of my fields in the future. So look for that interesting development. Yeah, Drake uh, just posted a link to uh, the article, and um, if you uh, search for me at Iowa State and send me an email, I can send you uh, links to many free publications that um, will tell you about energy use and economics and uh, some of the agronomics associated with uh, this work I've been talking about. You're on. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Drake, Drake posted my uh, email address as well. So. He's quicker than I am. So, um, Dick, I'm, I'm interested in uh, seeding uh, red clover into rye. I've, I've tried that before. Um, typically, when I've been planting rye, I've been seeding it at a fairly high rate, up to two bushels. And um, I've often found it's quite competitive, particularly in dry summers against the red clover. And uh, I'm wondering if one of the benefits you have of seeding a little bit lighter is uh, you're actually getting a better clover stand. I did have some uh, spots in one of those fields where I had lighter soils uh, this last year where I had the 112 pound, the two bushel rate of, of rye seeded that um, the medium red clover didn't withstand the those dry areas, but um, on the 
other parts of the field and maybe it was because we had a nice wet year to get that all established that it was able to come through as well as it did so I did lower my seeding rate some this year when I seeded in the fall I tried to aim for more uh, that 1 million seeds per acre type of a range which I think was around about a 90 pound um, drilling of rye so we'll see how that comes next year yeah one thing I found is that uh, triticale and rye are much more competitive than winter wheat against clover that if you want a, a good nurse crop for clover the winter wheat seems to be much more compatible with the clover than uh, either triticale or rye so that's another option although triticale and rye are more winter hard Yeah, I uh, see a question from Jake, and um, so my wheat rotations, uh, I've just started, this is, this fall was the first time that I'd planted winter wheat, it was a soft red winter wheat, and so I did drill it into soybeans, um, and I will, I was actually thinking that I would go with uh, more of a summer seeded mix, wait until after um, harvest of the wheat to go in. And I know there's uh, some some good farmers out in Ohio that are a little more experienced with uh, growing wheat than I am. And uh, so there's there's different kinds of mixes, uh, winter peas that, that could be put in after wheat harvest. Um, some other types of legumes that I might look into more in the future. So, uh, I've had a question about whether I've seen any use of these uh, multi crop rotations outside of my experiments. So, I would say that I didn't start this. Um, when I moved to Iowa in the 90s, I spent time with a number of uh, farmers, including Dick Thompson. And the first summer I moved here, I actually wound up riding in the tractor cab while Dick was cultivating or doing other tasks and just kind of listening to him describe what he was doing. And um, a lot of what I'm doing on this rotation experiment uh, were things I picked up from him. And other farmers I know in, in the PFI network have, have done some work with similar kinds of rotations. The area of uh, both Canada and, and uh, U.S. where these uh, more extended rotations are being used are uh, places like in Ontario and in Indiana and Ohio where uh, winter wheat grows well and uh, there's a tradition of frost seeding red clover. So th those are the kinds of places where uh, farmers seem uh, better acquainted with them and uh, they have places where they can uh, sell the wheat quite easily. Anyone else? I guess I would comment that there's uh, if you if people want to go to the sustainablecorn.org website, there's a uh, section there where you can uh, look at the effects of extended crop rotations. So. Uh, Marilyn asked whether there's a market for wheat in Iowa, and I would say generally not. There are places where you can uh, find people who want to buy it for uh, specialty reasons, but um, all the states around us seem to do quite well in marketing wheat, but uh, Iowa hasn't done a real good job on that. So uh, one thing to consider there would be whether you could find someone who wishes to feed it, because uh, wheat is quite a good concentrate for uh, livestock production. My intent with growing wheat was simply that I use a wheat as a uh, cover crop, uh, especially ahead of corn. Um, there's been concern with allelopathy where rye and triticale are used as cover crops ahead of corn and so with my interest in trying to plant into green cover crops and using mixes, um, 
I think that I can find uh, local markets uh, pers personally for my wheat through my local seed dealer that I buy my cover crop seed from. So, uh, Ryan asked whether we seed a cover crop following oats in the three-year rotation. And uh, in the system I work in, we seed the oats and the clover at the same time. We have a uh, clover box on our grain drill. And we have a drop tube that puts the clover slightly higher in the drill row. Uh, usually I like to plant uh, the grain a bit deeper than the forage legumes because they have smaller seeds. Um, we've also used a brilliant seeder um, after we've seeded the small grains with the drill. And that works really well. But it's an extra pass across the field. So we do that uh, as early in the spring as we can work the ground. Sometimes it's been the end of March. Sometimes it's uh, early April. Um, but basically, as, as soon as you can get a reasonably good seed bed, um, you can put it in. I have also done uh, direct drilling, no-till seeding of uh, small grains into uh, soybean residue. And you can put your uh, clover in that way as well. The thing to be careful about seeding small grains into uh, ground that hasn't been tilled is uh, you may have a higher weed pressure than if you work the ground or spray the ground first. There are uh, a number of things like um, ragweed and um, lamb's quarters that can do very well in cold weather germination situations and give your uh, small grain crop like oats that will run for its money. Winter grains, not that much of a problem with weeds. They tend to um, have um, beaten the weed problem at the time that uh, you're going in in the fall, there's not much weed pressure. And um, you can do well with uh, winter grain with very few weeds. Uh, when you mentioned um, drilling the clover and the oats together, why that is interesting. I have actually considered um, in that summer mix that we're trying to get established, um, putting the um, the clovers and the radish even uh, use use the frost seeder attachment and try and sprinkle them on the top, and then the cow peas, sun hemp. Um, and oats uh, would be drilled in and the disturbance of the soil, if that would be enough to get the uh, clovers kind of a little bit of soil scattered on top and, and then that, they would be able to germinate from a shallower depth, but uh, might need to harrow behind the, the drill if I'm gonna try to do something like that, so. Yeah, the, the key thing for us has always been to try to ensure that you've got really good seed soil contact. Mm -hmm. um, those little clover seedlings on the surface of the soil can dry out if they don't get steady rain. And um, if you can just get a little bit of soil over them, put a press wheel to firm the ground, that seed soil contact is enough to get that germinated and the seedling uh, up and out. But if you plant them too deep, uh, particularly if you get crusted soil, it's kind of death for small seeded things like clover. Great information, thank you. Any more questions for Matt and Dick? All right, any parting words, uh, Matt or Dick, that you'd like to leave us with? I wish you all a fine Thanksgiving, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, visit with you tonight. Uh, I'd echo those remarks. Thank you. Thank you both to Matt Lehman and uh, Dick Sloan. Uh, thank you all to the folks that attended the Farm and Arts Night. Uh, we appreciate the attendance, and um, please check out our website, practicalfarmers.org. Use the part in there.